right, well, let me just, uh, I did a video earlier today, but wasn't able to uh, get a good signal, so um, I'm doing it here uh, in my in my office at home. Hey, what's going on, Ruth? Good to see you, my sister. Excuse me. So um, I want to just discuss some things uh, that's been on my mind and on my heart um, for quite a while, for quite a while uh, now. Um, I've been doing ministry, particularly pastoral ministry apologetics, uh, for about 15 years, uh, 15 plus years. I mean, um, I've been saved for 16 of those uh, 15 years, and so I basically, you know, uh, had a insatiable desire. What's on? What's going on, EC? Hey, Latanya, good to see you, woke sister. Um, had had an insatiable desire since my conversion back in uh, 2000. Uh, got in pastoral ministry uh, in 2001 at my uh, first church uh, here in Houston, and. Um, just had an insatiable desire to learn, to to read, to study, to to understand uh, the doctrines that I hold dear today. Of course, being you know younger, there there's zeal uh, that if not if you're not careful can can cause more damage than good. Uh, what's going on, Edwin? Uh, that can cause more damage than good if it's not uh, you know contained uh, in its proper you know uh, context. So. During the course of my life, uh, you know, there have been there have been, you know, discussions, debates, you know, that kind of thing, you know, looking back on them uh, could have done things differently, could have done things better. But nonetheless, it has never taken away the desire nor the calling uh, to be a watchman on the wall, to be an apologist. Um, I, I am still a pastor. Um, the Bible says the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. Um, so, you know what God has called me to do, I'm pretty sure that there are a lot of people, you know, uh, like myself, who has a love for the church, uh, who has a love and a desire to see God's name honored, to see Christ exalted, and not to not to have the spirit of God blasphemed. And so what we strive to do, people like myself, what we strive to do is to raise awareness uh, to the church, raise awareness to the body of Christ, sounding the alarm, uh, bringing attention to, to issues and to things that may cause uh, people to, to stumble into sin, that may fall into carnality, worldliness, and even ultimately lose their soul uh, if we're not um, careful. Uh, so I, I, I come as a fellow brother in Christ. I do not come with a superiority complex. I don't come looking down uh, my nose upon my brothers and sisters in Christ, but I do come, uh, come graciously, but also come boldly, and I come straight with it. And, and I say that because there are some of you who have followed my ministry, uh, who read my posts, whether it is on Facebook or Twitter, uh, things of that nature, and it can come off as being, I guess you can say, kind of hard hitting some would say harsh some would say terse uh some would just say straight up offensive and sinful and disrespectful and unloving and and things like that well you know my my my, my goal is not to intentionally offend anyone that is not my goal but if you are offended you need to ask yourself the question why am i offended by what this brother is saying why am i offended when i hear people like this this brother you know every day you know on social media you know, exposing or calling attention to, to people and to uh, situations or uh, churches or preachers, whatever the case might be. What, what, what is his reason or reasons for doing so? Well, like I said at the outset, because I love the church, because I love the body of Christ, because I love my brothers and sisters uh, who I may never see this side of heaven, but hopefully one day we'll see them uh, in glory. And so my job as a watchman, my job as an apologist, my job is as a fellow brother in Christ is to to warn, to sound the alarm, to to cause people to think biblically, because this is what the body of Christ needs. We're living in the last days where people are being led astray, where people are being told that it's OK to live any kind of way they want and still think that they are a Christian.
and never to have those views challenged, you can live like hell and still go to heaven. That is a lie straight from the pit of hell. Because you can't live like hell and still make it into heaven. You can't live like the devil and think that you're going to see the blessed Savior, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's not going to happen. It is impossible for that to happen. No true born-again believer, no true follower of Christ will live in habitual sin as a pattern and habit of life and think that they are okay with God. You're being deceived. Straight up. So when you hear me post or see me, you know, post things or hear me on, on you know, social media or in, in interviews or hear or watch videos that I may, you know, talk about this person or that person, please understand that it's not coming from a place of, of contention. It's not coming from a place where I'm trying to stir up trouble and, and stir up uh, discord and dissension and division in the body of Christ. That has never been uh, my heart, never been my attitude. My whole heart and attitude is, is that when there are issues that are being brought before the public, and in particularly being brought before the body of Christ, then we have the right, I have the right, you have the right to make a public response to that. No one is off limits in the kingdom of God from being corrected. Of course, there's a way that we correct. Of course, there's a way that we approach people, particularly those who are older than us, our elders. We have to respect our elders. In first, uh, Timothy chapter 5 verse 1 and 2 it tells us how we are to respond to the elderly those who are older men we are to treat as fathers older men older women we are to treat as mothers younger women as sisters younger brothers younger men as brothers so there, there's a level there's a there's a relationship and a relating to how we are to govern ourselves when we are engaging in conversation or in correction there should be a respect to that but no one is exempt from being corrected whether you are eight years old or 80 years old sin is sin and how we deal with sin should be according to the scriptures but should be done respectfully um, so I say that because the question that I that I pose tonight and even you know in the Facebook uh, topic when is it right to fight when is it right to fight? Because people think that what I do and what others do, like me, is that we just look to fight. We, we're just trying to find ways to, to, to stir up confusion. Uh, we're trying to find, you know, anything to try to stir up a, a, a battle and to have, you know, uh, a, a Twitter war or a Facebook, you know, fight. No true, no true believer uh, wants to do that. Um, do we do it perfectly? I'll be the first one to tell you. No, we do not. No, I do not. There have been times when I may have said things that the Spirit of God has convicted me for that I have to make a public apology and ask for forgiveness uh, for that. So none of us are exempt from being wrong or having to repent publicly. But it still doesn't mean that we are out here trying to stir up confusion. So. I want to speak from a, a personal place in my life, and hopefully, you know, those of you who watch this video later uh, will hear my heart, and at the same time, you know, challenge yourselves regarding uh, people who are watchmen, people who are, you know, those who stand on the wall and 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 look at what goes on in this world, and you know, just just this past month we had an election, and. and I saw, unfortunately, a lot of people's true colors regarding two candidates that I believe caused more division and strife in the body of Christ than when Barack Obama ran for office uh, twice in these past eight years. I saw a lot of division. I saw a lot of mudslinging. I saw a lot of name calling. And this is among Christians, all because of a political party. And when God's word tells us how we are to live, I believe that includes politics too. But unfortunately, we live in this day and age where now the word of God seems to be taking a back seat when it comes to things that we want to do. You know, I, uh, I basically have been slandered, attacked, maligned, uh, misrepresented because of what I do because people think that 
when my name is mentioned, oh, that dude, all he wants to do is like, all he wants to do is fight people, man. He he just trying to get he just trying to get clicks. He just trying to get you know uh, people to follow him. It has never been about that. Never been about that with me. If I say something, I I strive and try to back it up with the Word of God, with the Scriptures, because that is my goal. I don't care about my opinion. My opinion matters not. What matters is, is what does God's word say? What is what is his opinion? What is his view on this issue? So I want to I want to raise some questions because earlier in the video that um, that I, I posted, but I had to take it down because of um, transmission issues. The uh, signal was down, but I wanted to pose this question. When you read Second Timothy, chapter two, verse 24, this is a verse that I hear a lot of people try to use uh, in defense of or in defense against me doing what i do they'll say what well, the bible says in, in second timothy 2 24 that the lord's bond servant must not be quarrelsome and they'll, they'll just stop right there they'll just say you know the lord's bond servant must not be quarrelsome he, he must not be a fighter he must not be a brawler he must not be a person that you know uh gets into arguments with people is that really true when we read 2 Timothy 2.24, is that what Paul is really saying? Is, is Paul really saying that no Christian uh, or, or people like myself, that I shouldn't get in any type of uh, arguments, debates, quarrels with anyone? If you believe that, then I believe that you're not reading your Bible, that you're not properly exegeting and interpreting the text according to what Paul meant by what he said in 2 Timothy 2.24. Because what God has called me to do may not be what God has called you to do. So if God has called me to expose and if God has called me to call out and to confront people, situations, and issues for the purpose of raising awareness and, and, and causing people to think biblically, then to say that I'm being quarrelsome because you don't like my approach or you don't like what I say or how I say it, then you're violating Romans 14. You're telling me that basically your view and your per and your perception and also your preference now needs to become my precept. And the Bible says, who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master, he stands and falls. So I just understand that when God has called me to a task, I'm going to be faithful to the task that he has called me to do. I'm not I'm not so concerned about what God has called you to do as long as what you're doing does not cause other people to sin. See, any calling that God gives, it doesn't cause us to sin and it does not cause us to 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 cause other people to sin against their brother and sister. Because the, the God that I know and serve and believe that wrote this book. These are spiritual gifts given by the father through the Holy Spirit and he gives it to each one as he wills so just because you don't like what I say or just because you don't like what people like me or Patrick Hampton or wh whoever wh whoever G Craig Lewis it doesn't matter who they are you may not like what we say you may not like how we say it but guess what the question is are what we is what we're saying biblical and are, is what we're saying lining up to what the Word of God says? You don't have to like the approach. You don't have to like the delivery. But you must bring all of those questions to the text of Scripture. So when I read 2 Timothy 2.24, when it says, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. And I hear people say this to me all the time. The majority of my life has been spent trying to explain to people that I'm not divisive. And I'm talking about within the body of Christ. I'm not talking about those outside of the church. I'm talking about those inside of the church, those who are professing brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I have spent the majority of my time in life defending the calling that God has given to me, all because people think that what I'm doing is causing and creating a wedge versus bringing and building a bridge now again i'm not talking about i'm being perfect here because i am like you james says we all stole in many ways but the pattern and 
manner of my life has never been to cause people to stumble into sin. So God has called me to sound the alarm. He's called me to raise awareness. He's called me to blow the whistle. I am not a heresy hunter. I'm not a person who has to look for false doctrine. Last time I checked, every time I wake up in the morning, there's false doctrine, there's error, there's heresy, there's false teaching and false teachers all over the internet. So I don't have to search for anything. It's right there. So what I'm saying is, when you read the text in 2 Timothy 2.24, does that mean that people like me and others who stand the wall, that we are guilty of violating that text? I would say no, and here's why. Because context matters. The preceding verse of 2 Timothy 2.24 says this in verse 23. He says, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. He's talking to Timothy and telling Timothy, Timothy, this is how you need to govern yourself. This is what you need to watch out for. This is how you need to carry yourself. This is what you need to do. This is how you need to engage in conversations with certain people. He says in verse 23 again, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. Then he brings the conjunctive into this text in verse 24. And the Lord's bond servant must not be quarrelsome. See, when you read it and isolate it from its intended context, you have people like me sounding like we're guilty for getting into quote unquote quarrels. The question is, what kind of quarrel is Paul forbidding Timothy and those of us who are ministers of the gospel? And technically, every last one of us as Christians are ministers of the gospel. Paul is not saying that we are not to engage in any kind of quarrel. He qualifies what kind of quarrel that we are not to engage in in verse 23 and connects it with verse 24. I'll read it again, and hopefully the flow of it now will make more sense than what you have been reading before or what, have, what people have been telling you how to read it. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23 and 24, it says, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels, and the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. Does that make better sense to you now? He says, avoid these kind of conversations, foolish, ignorant speculations, because it produces quarrels. It produces fights. It produces contentions. Paul is not saying that you and I are not to engage in quarrels when the gospel or when the truth is at stake. And I'm going to prove my point in just a moment. Because in verse 23, the word for quarrelsome, he says this is the person that likes to fight, that likes to engage in word battles. That's not my attitude. That's not my heart. That's not what I do. Because I'm not a quarrelsome person. But I will quarrel with anyone who violates God's word for the sake of truth. But I don't quarrel about foolish speculations. That violates the text. So when is it right to fight? When is it right to get in with people who violate and who cause people to stumble into sin? Because if you're saying that 2 Timothy chapter 2... Verse 24 forbids Christians to get in any kind of argument. Then now you're going to be faced with some other paradoxical texts. Amen, Scott. Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes. It has nothing to do about contending and defending the gospel from corruptors. Exactly, brother. Exactly. And I don't know about you, Scott, but I, I'm tired of hearing people telling me that 2 Timothy 2.24 is what I'm violating when I know I'm not violating it. Because maybe they don't understand or maybe they have been taught wrong, but it's time out for being taught wrong. We need to teach and say what the Bible says. Because again, if 2 Timothy 2.24 is a prohibition for people like me 
and even people like Scott Newman and, 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 and countless other brothers and sisters that I see that are trying to sound the alarm and, 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 and raise the, 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 the awareness of the body of Christ, when we see all this kind of foolishness going on, then what you're telling me then is, is that we can't say anything. And I don't believe the Bible teaches that. So he says, the word for quarrelsome, it means to fight, to engage in a war of words, to quarrel, to wrangle, to dispute. It doesn't mean that you and I walk around trying to look for things to fight about. No, 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 no. He qualifies what he says in verse 23, that we're to avoid foolish and ignorant, moronic and uneducated ill-informed arguments is what Paul is admonishing and, and advising his protege Timothy not to engage in. And I hope I'm making sense because I want to free some people up because if God has called you to be a watchman, if God has called you to be a person to warn the body of Christ, because we need that in the body of Christ. We need people with discernment. We need people that are going to stand up, speak up, and step up against the sin that is going on in our churches. And I'm as sure as God has called me to do that as I am sitting here in front of you right now tonight discussing this topic. But if people are saying that 2 Timothy 2.24, uh, you know, say, oh, the Bible says, you know, the, the, the Lord's bond servant must not quarrel. Well, you know what? Here's an interesting point that I want to ask you and question you with. If that is your take on that, then what do you do with Proverbs 28? verse 4. Some of you may not have even read Proverbs 28 verse 4, so I'll give you some time to turn there. In Proverbs 28 verse 4, this is the wisdom literature, of course, so the principle is still true. Proverbs 28 4 says, those who forsake the law praise the wicked, but those who keep the law strive with them. So now, if you're saying that 2 Timothy 2.24 forbids me to quarrel with anybody, regardless of whatever it is, then what do you do with Proverbs 28.4? And I'm not done. i got some other texts to share with you. What, do you. what do you do with that? What are we to do with these texts? Because if that's what you're saying, then we have a dilemma. Because Solomon, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says... Those who forsake the law praise the wicked, but those who keep the law strive, fight. It means actually to excite oneself against a foe, to wage war with one. That's what the text says. So if that's what you are telling people that they're not to be, you know, getting into arguments with people and and we just to be peaceful and we're not to say anything we're just to you know have this 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 you know uh rollover attitude when we see false doctrine run amok in our churches i think you're misrepresenting the word of god or you are misinformed either way it's not a good look because second timothy 2 24 must be understood in light of verse 23 because he tells us clearly what kind of arguments and quarreling we are to avoid. No one again walks around trying to look for a fight and look to quarrel anybody. No one who's walking by the spirit, mind you. So what do you do with Proverbs 28 verse 4? Where it says, those who forsake the law praise the wicked, but those who keep the law strive with them, fight with them, excite oneself. They are... They are bothered in their soul. They are exercised in their spirit. It is a call to respond to false doctrine, false teachers against the foes of those who do it. And they're waging war against those kinds of people who are leading other people away from the word of God. And they're not using fleshly means, mind you. Confrontation can be godly. All confrontation is not ungodly. What makes it ungodly is if you are operating by the flesh versus the spirit. And this is why Paul tells us, walk by the spirit so you won't fulfill that. We won't fulfill the lust and desires of the flesh. So 
I'm just asking, how do, how do you interpret these texts, people? For those of you who come against individuals like myself and tell me and others that we should not, you know, uh, uh, get into arguments with people. Well, we need to ask ourselves the questions going forward. What kind of argument is this? Because I see throughout scripture, people get into, into arguments about serious matters that affects one's eternal destiny and their eternal state. And they were not charged with being quarrelsome. They were not charged with being contentious. They were not charged with being in sin. Titus 1.9, again, Paul charges Titus this time and tells him how he is to govern himself and how he is to carry himself. In verse 9, it says, holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching that he may be able both to exhort and sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Why, Paul? For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision who must be silenced. You know what that word silence means? It means to be muzzled by the mouth. They must be stopped. They must be shut up. Because they are going into households and they are teaching things, upsetting whole families, teaching things which they are not to teach. That involves confrontation. That involves some serious debating, some serious arguing, arguing about what, you may ask, arguing about the truth the truth that is at stake and that is in jeopardy from being overthrown if we don't do anything about it. Now, these are just questions that I'm asking. If you're saying that, that, that 2 Timothy 2.24, if you are interpreting 2 Timothy 2.24 in defense against those who are watchmen, those who are engaging in debates and in arguments regarding the word of God and its truth, you better read verse 23 of that same passage and connect it instead of separating it. And stop trying to tell people like me and others how we are to function in our calling when it is not your call. See, the, the blessing about the body of Christ is this. Everybody has a gift. And everybody is to function in the gift that God has called them to function in. One thing you have never seen me do is tell someone else how to run and how to move in their own lane and in their own calling, in their own ministry. The only time you see me or hear me say something is if what they're doing is causing people to sin. And it has to come from the word of God, book, chapter and verse. Because I don't care about my preference. See, that's, that's, that's the liberating thing. When you are free in Christ, then you're able to serve your brothers and sisters, not worry about the opinions of other people. And so this is why I know for myself, some of you have no problem with what I say. But there are those of you who do, and all I'm saying is, what does God call you to do? Whatever God has called you to do, then do what God has called you to do and not look over in my lane or look over in your brother or sister's lane and worry about them. I think Jesus had words for somebody who tried to do that after he was resurrected. You remember, you remember Peter just after the Lord was resurrected before he ascends into glory. Christ talks to his disciples and one of the things that he said about John, Peter was like, well, Lord, what about what about this man? What, what, what about this man? And Jesus said, if I want him to remain with me, what is it to you? What, 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 what business is it of yours what I want to do with my servants? How I want to use my servant? How I have called my servant to do what I have ordained him to do? See, some of you are so focused on everybody else's calling, you're missing out on your own calling. And you know what? Why are you worrying and looking at what I'm doing and looking at what other people are doing and, and not liking what I'm doing and not liking what this other person is doing? You're going to have to give an account one day for the calling that you're not doing anything with. See, while I'm, while I'm in the Lord's field doing my work, I'm stacking up 
rewards for myself. You, my friend, you, sir, you, ma'am, what are you stacking up? You're wasting your time focusing on the time that what God has called me to spend on. And what I'm saying is, I don't see in Scripture anywhere where arguing for the sake of truth is sinful. I, I, I would rather people just say, you know what, I don't really care for that type of, you know, ministry, and just leave it at that. But when you say you're being contentious, you're being divisive, you're, you're causing division in the body of Christ by how you communicate truth, who are you to judge the servant of another? If it's not sin, if it cannot be defended, book, chapter, and verse, then God says to you, shut up. Focus on what I called you to do and only what I called you to do. Another thing is, is this. What do you do with Proverbs 26, 4, and 5? Because see, those of us who are watching on the wall, we struggle with this verse too. The proverb says, do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. Then in that same, same stem, he says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Well, my goodness, which one is it? Answer, you have to decide which one you follow. There's a time when you don't engage a fool the Bible says, and then there is a time when you must engage a fool, lest he or she be wise in their own eyes. And you know what that means sometimes? That may cause for sarcasm. That may cause for a strong, stern rebuke. Paul did it to the Corinthians in his writings to the Corinthians. You are already rich. You are already this. You are already that. You become kings without us. Paul is using sarcasm to respond to the foolish claims and foolish assumptions of the people that were following false teachers. There's a time and place for that kind of behavior. But just because you don't like it does not make it sin. You just don't like it. I don't, I don't waste time trying to tell people how to serve God if how they're serving God is according to what God's word says how they're to serve. In Acts 15, 1 and 2, you have another paradox for those of you who don't believe that people like me should get into arguments about anything. In Acts 15, 1 and 2, justification was at stake here. People were told if they weren't circumcised, then they weren't, they weren't going to be saved. And the text shows us clearly that that caused a problem in the early church, so much so that verse 1 says, And some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Verse 2 says, And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debated with them. Of course, they had a Jerusalem council and they settled the matter. But when Paul and Barnabas heard about this, there was dissension. There was strife. There was a mutual conversation going on, but it wasn't just this, oh, brother, we just disagree. We're going to agree to disagree. No, 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 no. No, sir. No, ma'am. You have souls now at stake. You have people now thinking that they must undergo some type of ritual under the Mosaic law, which was already done away with when Christ fulfilled it. According to the custom of the Mosaic law, these people were being told to do something in order to be saved. They were being told that works now precede salvation. And this is why Paul and Barnabas had to take this matter to the mat. They had to plant their flag on a hill and be willing to die for that. And so they had a heated debate. Heated dissension. 
Let me read it again because I want y'all to read and hear this because I don't want y'all thinking I'm making this stuff up. I mean, because after all, you know, who am I? You know, unless, you know, unless somebody big name uh, says this kind of stuff, then, you know, then you'll may, maybe you'll believe it. But hopefully you'll believe what the word of God says more than man. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, great dissension, mega decision, dissension and debate. I'm just asking. The word for dissension is strife. So if you say, well, 2 Timothy 2.24 says we're not to strive. Well, strive about what is the question? Strive about what? What are you striving about? Are you striving over foolish questions, foolish arguments, foolish speculations? Then yes, that text applies. But if you are striving about the truth because souls are being lost or have the possibility or propensity to be lost in an eternal hell, then that's not sin. We're to strive for that. We're to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints, as Jude 3 says. So, what do you do with these texts? And these are just a few. This is not even all of them. What do you do? Do not answer fool. Answer fool. What do you do? The Lord's servant must not strive, but then you see those who forsake the law praise the wicked, but those who keep the law strive with them. Is the Spirit of God bipolar? I think not. Or do we need to step our hermeneutical game up? I think so. Here's another one. 1 Corinthians 11, 19, what do you do with that? Paul says there must be factions among you, heresies among you, so that those who are approved may be made known among you. I'm just asking the question here. What do you do with that? How do you respond? to these types of texts. Let me read a commentary from John MacArthur. He says, quote, Paul was well aware that division cannot be entirely avoided. Until the Lord returns, there will always be tares among the wheat and disobedient believers as well, for there must be factions among you. There must be, translate the single word day, which means it is necessary or it must be and denotes necessary, excuse me, necessity or compulsion of any kind. The paradox is that it was necessary for there to be factions in the Corinthian church in order that those who are approved may have become evident among you. The worldliness and fleshly disobedience of those who caused the divisions would expose and highlight the love, harmony, spirituality of those who are approved. The word approved, which is the word dokamos, refers to that which has passed the test. The term was used of precious metals tried in fire and, and proven to be pure. Church division, ungodly and sinful as it is. Listen, this is what I'm saying here. I'm still quoting this commentary. Very key point. Church division, ungodly and sinful as it is, nevertheless is used by the Lord to prove the worth of his faithful saints. In the midst of bickering and divisiveness, they are separated out as pure gold is from the dross. Evil helps manifest good. Trouble in the church creates a situation in which true spiritual strength, wisdom, and leadership can be manifested, end quote. The reason why I want to talk about this stuff, because I have yet to hear anyone say, when I hear people quoting 2 Timothy 2.24, I always hear them isolate that text and try to have people like me and maybe they're doing it and they don't even realize that they're doing it but nonetheless it's being done because it causes people like me to say well but man I mean my goodness then when, when can I say something well brother you know you know the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome I'm not quarreling I'm just I'm just dealing with this issue and I'm I'm trying to raise awareness and expose sin that is being propagated in the body of Christ and it seems like no one wants to say anything about it. Oh well brother, you know, you don't wanna you know you don't want to, you know, try to, you know, you don't want people to think that you are a contentious person. Let me tell you something. I can care less what people think about me. 
And let me qualify what I'm saying by that. If your attitude and, and focus and purpose is to basically tell me that I shouldn't say anything because people are going to, you know, uh, look at me a certain way, then here's the question that I ask you then. What about Paul? Because Paul says, if I was a pleaser of man, I cannot be a servant of Christ. Brothers and sisters, you can't have it both ways. Know your calling. Trust that God will give you the strength to do what he has called you to do. Those who love you will support you. Those who don't, won't. Those who misunderstand you, if they are willing to understand you, then you engage them in conversation to help them understand you better. But what you don't have time to do is to prove that God has called you to do this. Because what happens now is, is that the enemy takes that and uses that as a deterrent. And it causes you to get off focus and to get off your mission and your assignment. I don't have that time to waste. I don't know about you. Uh, somebody said, pushing back a little, bro. Those who question your conduct may feel like they are doing what you are doing. They are. They feel responsible for, for how you can influence others. Well, here's the thing. All of us are influencing somebody. The question is, what am I influencing people to do? I'm influencing people to think biblically. I'm, influ I'm influencing people to think godly. What I'm not trying to influence people to do is to not do what God has called them to do. See, again, this is my point. I'm saying if God has called you to be a watchman or to be an evangelist, whatever the case might be, whatever the, whatever the calling is that's found in God's word, then you do that. You be faithful in that and you let God sort out the rest of that stuff. Because here's a question I, I try to tell people all the time and ask people all the time. If you don't like how I'm doing something, and then I have to do it your way. Then what happens when somebody else comes along after you, mind you, and they say, well, I need to do it their way. And then somebody else comes along after them and says, well, brother, I think you need to do it this way. You need to be more this or, or less this. So then, my goodness, then when can I be what God has called me to be? I'll wait. When? When was Seiko of those who are called to do what I'm doing? When are we free to function and to be what God has called us to be? Because I just, I just, I just find this rather odd that more people come to me about my method and about my delivery based on preference and then some will try to go as far as to say that i'm violating scripture and then when i challenge a book chapter and verse and they pull up second timothy 2 24 i'm like stop stop what about verse 23 and what do i hear crickets because i gave you six texts so far six of them and i'm saying if you're saying that second timothy 2 24 forbids and prohibits people like me from contending and quarreling or fighting or arguing of any kind, then when is it right to fight? Because some of y'all fight over a parking spot, then you would fight over the precepts of God's word. And to that, I say shame on you. Some of y'all rush to go to Walmart for a Black Friday sale but don't rush to tell somebody that they're going to hell if they don't stop living in unrepentant sin. To you, I say shame on you. To you, I say repent. See, you'll fight for what you want to fight for. And most of the time, what we fight for have no eternal value at all. But then you'll tell people like me, I shouldn't be fighting because look at what the world, the world is looking at us. Well, the world is looking at you too. Look at how you talk. Look at what you say. Look at what you post. At least what I'm posting is raising awareness. At least what I'm posting is causing people to think, even if it makes you mad or upsets you or, or angers you. Why are you mad? And how do you how do you hear somebody's texts? That's another thing. H how do you hear somebody's texts? 
How do you discern tone from a text without asking questions? How do, how do you do that? How do you tell a person that they sound angry when you haven't even delved into what they are talking about? You haven't asked questions. You haven't done your part. You, you, you've judged a matter before the time. And all I'm saying is, how do you, how do I respond to people who say that, hey, the Bible says the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. I agree the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be quarrelsome over what is the question? Because there is a time to quarrel. There is a time to fight. This is why I showed you in Proverbs 28, 4. Those who forsake the law praise the wicked. Do we not see this going on today? Just recently, Lecrae took a picture with Absol along with propaganda. What message does that send to the church? What message does that send to the body of Christ? What message does that send to the naive, to the impressionable, to the neophyte, to the newbie in the faith? When you take pictures with unbelievers that are God-haters, that are uh, demon-possessed, and you call them your brother, what message does that send? How do you, how does 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17, how do you apply that when you have a picture like that posted on social media for everyone to see, but you profess to be a Christian? What do you do with that? How do you respond to that? I read on someone's Facebook post earlier uh, this week, a particular CHH artist calling people like me who respond to statements of things that Lecrae or any other artist that, that, that's in sin does, called us the Lecrae police. The Lecrae police. Why? When, when, is it, when, had it, when did it become wrong to expose sin? When has it become wrong, or when did it become wrong, for us to apply Ephesians 5.11 that says, have nothing to do with the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. So it just seems to me that people frown upon those who call out sin that is made known publicly. Again, we're not talking about hunting and looking for sin. I'm talking about sin that's made manifest, that is made known, is being posted as if it's not sin. And you better not say that it is sin, because if you say that it's sin, I'm going to call you a Pharisee. So now they're telling you and I that we're the ones that's not saved, because the Pharisees were not saved. Yeah, they knew Bible, but so does Satan. And this is the world that we're living in. And what I'm saying is, show me in Scripture. Well, what I'm called to do is now divisive, is now violating 2 Timothy 2.24. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to, to bet if I were a betting man, people like Phineas, remember Phineas in Numbers 25? Remember him? The one that had zeal for God and God gave this brother props for his zeal because he saw Israel whoring around and committing all types, types of immorality. And he came in and started killing folk. I'm not saying we do that today. That's not, what I'm, that's not my point. What I'm saying is that when he saw the name of God blaspheme, when he saw God's people, Israel, blaspheme God and defame his name, it grieved him. Grieved him so that he took action. See, we would call that extreme. God called it righteous. Now, again, I'm not saying that this is what we're called to do. We're not called to kill somebody when they, because they're sinning. No, no, no. That, I'm not saying that. So please don't twist my words up like that. But what I am saying is we should have a righteous indignation when we see wretchedness and uh, reveling going on in the body of Christ. You see, some of you would say Phineas was wrong for doing what he did. You'll say that Phineas crossed the line. That's not what my Bible says to me. Matter of fact, I want to turn there real quick and I want to read it because maybe some of you have not 
looked at that passage. Numbers 25. He says here, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest has turned away my wrath from the sons of Israel and that he was jealous with my jealousy among them. See, he didn't have sinful response to this. He says, Phineas was jealous with the jealousy that I had because God alone should be worshipped. And so he says in verse, seven, verse 12, rather, therefore behold, I give him my covenant of peace and it shall be for him and his descendants after him a covenant of a perpetual priesthood because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the sons of Israel. Phineas had a calling. Phineas didn't care about what anybody said. God was dishonored. God was blasphemed. God was mocked. And God's man responded. Jeremiah. See, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just bringing these names to mind, because even in this age and dispensation of grace, we need to understand that God is still holy and He is still raising up a people that are zealous for His name. He told Jeremiah, "Look, I've appointed you, I've called you to tear down, to uproot, to overthrow, to build. I've called you to do that." So Jeremiah's ministry was different than Nehemiah's ministry or different than Moses's ministry. His ministry was called by God and was commissioned by God for a particular people and a particular function and task. My calling, my role is to minister, to raise awareness to the black community, to the black church, to the urban community, because our churches among the black community are a mess. I'm not saying my, my European, my Caucasian brothers and sisters are not in any other ethnicity, but I'm saying God has called me to do this. And so my style of reaching black folk in the hood is not gonna be, oh, brother, how are you? That's not my, that's not my style, that's not even my personality. That's not how I move, that's not what God has equipped me to do. So my conversations and my way of communicating may be different than your way. But praise God, that's your way. Let me have my way. And as long as my way is not violating scripture, then who are you to judge the servant of another? So you have Phineas. God used him. His, his name was blasphemed and, and ridiculed and mocked. He responded righteously. Jeremiah was called to a particular task and to a particular work. And he says, Jeremiah, listen, I'm not telling you to, to play games with these people. He said, I'm sending you to these people. And I'm telling you that I have set you and appointed you this day over the nations. Verse, uh, verse 10 and Jeremiah 1. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up, to break down, to destroy, to overthrow, to build, to plant. That was Jeremiah's mission. That may not be your mission. But for people who have that mission or calling to raise awareness, to get in people's grill, if you will, leave them alone. Let them do what God has called them to do. You may not like spicy food, but just because you don't like spicy food does not mean that all spicy food is wrong or bad. You just don't like spicy food, so don't eat spicy food. If a particular restaurant does not serve a particular food, you can't get mad at the restaurant that does not serve the particular food that you like. Go to the restaurant that, that serves the particular food that you like. It's simple. This is what makes the body of Christ so beautiful and so unique. Different functions, but one body. If I'm called to be a mouth, you can't make me an ear. If I'm called to be a hand, you can't make me to be a foot. And for you to try to make me to be that, you're now attacking the sovereignty of God because God is sovereign in who he has ordained and who he has called to use. Not you, not me. Remember Ezekiel? I got to turn there because I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut this down in, in hopefully in five minutes. In five minutes. I don't want to be longer than that. Ezekiel was called by God, not by man, by God. Ezekiel chapter 2, 
Verse 1, they said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet that I may speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. Then he said to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the sons of Israel, a rebellious house who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. And I am sending you to them who are stubborn and obstinate children. And you shall say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, as for them, whether they listen or not, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, neither fear them nor fear their words. Though thistles and thorns are with you, and you sit on scorpions, neither fear their words nor be dismayed at their presence, for they are a rebellious house. But you shall speak my words to them, whether they listen or not, for they are rebellious. Now you, son of man, listen to what I am speaking to you. Do not be rebellious like the rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I am giving you. Then I looked and beheld a hand was extended to me and lo, a scroll was in it. And when he spread it out before me, it was written on the front and back and written on it were lamentations, mourning and woe. Verse, uh, chapter three, verse four. Then he said to me, son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. Notice, speak my words. Speak with my words to them. For you are not being sent to a people of unintelligible speech or difficult language, but to the house of Israel, nor to many peoples of unintelligible speech or different language, whose words you cannot understand. But I have sent you to them who should listen to you. Yet the house of, of Israel will not be willing to listen to you, since they are not willing to listen to me. Surely the whole house of Israel is stubborn and obstinate. Behold, I have made your face as hard as their faces, and your forehead as hard as their foreheads. Like emery, harder than flint, I have made your forehead. Do not be afraid of them, or be dismayed before them, for though they are a rebellious house. See, some of you can't do what I do, because God has not equipped you to do what I do. And you know what? That's fine. That's fine. However God has equipped you to engage the culture and engage the people that is in your life, in your sphere of influence, then do that. But please stop trying to tell me and others who do this every day that we are violating God's word, that we're being contentious, that we're being quarrelsome. Quarrelsome about what? About your preference? Remember, last, last point, here's what I'm saying in all of this. Here's what I'm saying in all of this, what I've just said in the past hour. And thank you for listening to me. At the end of the day, brothers and sisters, I'm not the divisive one. I'm not the quarreler. I'm not the one that is sowing discord and, and causing confusion. Regardless, and despite what people may think and say, that is not what God has called me. Because I know what he's called me to do. So I'm not the one that is causing division. I'm not the one that is stirring up confusion. That was the same accusation that Ahab gave to Elijah. Remember that in 1 Kings 18, I believe in, in verse 17 and 18, he says, is that you, you troubler of Israel? And Elijah said, I'm not the one that's troubling Israel. You're the one who is troubling Israel by leading them to obey and follow false gods. Elijah was spreading rumors around, I mean, excuse me, Ahab was spreading rumors about Elijah all throughout Israel, calling this man a troublemaker. He called him the troubler of Israel. And some of you are making statements about me and making statements about other brothers and sisters and saying that we're being contentious, that we're being quarrelsome and all that. You need to stop that. You really need to stop that. Because even in Jude, Jude 19 says, these are the ones who cause divisions, worldly minded, devoid of truth. I'm not worldly minded. I'm not without the spirit. That's who causes the divisions. Not those who are filled with the spirit and not those who are not of this world. So all I'm saying, brothers and sisters, tonight is this. When is it right to fight? It's right to fight when God's word is being attacked and his people are being led astray. That's it. If you want to get in contact with me, you can reach me, SaikoWoods at Yahoo.com, S-A-I-K-O-W-O-O-D-S at Yahoo.com. Thank you for your time. Have a blessed weekend and whatever you do.